Hello everyone, welcome to another edition of Brain Scratch Searchlight. I'm your host, John Lorden. This is a day of tough videos for me, um, but this is a case that I certainly want to cover. Um, it's weird because it's almost big enough for a full brain scratch or maybe even several full brain scratches, but I'm going to try to weed it down to some of the most important pertinent details and let's see if we can do something to bring Chiron Horman home. So here we start at the Charlie Project and we can see several photos of Chiron Richard Horman. Uh, including here on the lower right they did an age progression but that was done way back in 2011 and that was progressing him to the age of nine at that time uh, so if we're talking about it now he's gonna be more like 14 and I can't find a more recent age progression to bring him to that age but this is the best we've got for right now missing since June 4th 2010 from Portland Oregon um, his date of birth is September 9th 2002 he was seven years old three foot, eight inches tall, 50 pounds, Caucasian male, brown hair, blue eyes. Chiron wears metal framed eyeglasses. Now we don't know if that's still the case, um, if someone may have taken him, um, perhaps they want to change his look a little bit, they would probably get him contacts or get rid of the glasses for some reason. So that's why you'll notice in this age progression they've even removed the glasses from him. He was last seen wearing a black t-shirt with CSI in green lettering it just really hits me in a weird place that he's wearing a CSI shirt in the last known photo of him. Um, you know, I don't know if he's a fan of that show, um, but that is some, a show that obviously glamorizes um, the search for justice using far out technical tools um, that don't always exist in reality. And I even went looking online today for um, detectors for cadaver detectors just I wanted to see where the science was at in terms of us having a device almost something like a um, like a metal detector or something along those lines uh, so that search parties could go out and potentially detect uh, remains of, of some kind and unfortunately the technology is nowhere it's there it's just it doesn't exist um, the the best thing that we have right now are cadaver dogs and uh, unfortunately if you look into the training of them there's even some discrepancies if they're trained with synthetic uh, agents that are used to mimic the smell of DK that might not be as reliable as dogs that are trained uh, with actual remains um, but it's it's just crazy to me that we don't have the science really understood even for how the dogs work we really don't know uh, what specific agents are released during the decay process that are triggering the dogs. All we know is that whatever it is, it happens pretty much a day or two after a person dies and it continues all the way through disintegration to bone fragment. And if I recall correctly, there's like over 400 different um, reactions and chemicals that are releasing during all that. Uh, and we really, we have no idea why, why the dogs are so good at it, but those are definitely our best tools. So last known clothing, black t-shirt with CSI and a handprint image on the front. Uh, size seven black cargo pants, white Hanes athletic socks and worn size 11 black Skechers sneakers with orange trim. He is allergic to bee stings. And let's get into the details of his disappearance. Chiron was last seen in Portland, Oregon on June 4th, 2010. He usually rode the bus to Skyline Elementary School where he was a second grader. The school is in the 11500 block of Skyline Boulevard in a rural area in northwest Portland, about two miles from Chiron's home in the 15700 block of Sheltered Nook Road. His stepmother, Terry Lynn Moulton Horman, stated she drove him to school because there was a science fair that day and Chiron wanted to set up his exhibit, a display about the red-eyed tree frog. They arrived shortly after 8 a.m and dropped Chiron's coat and backpack off at his classroom, a witness saw Terry and Chiron together at 8.15 in front of Chiron's exhibit. The bell rang at 8.45 a.m. and Terry says she left then. She said Chiron told her he was going to his classroom. He has never been heard from again. Now, the, the thing that is insane about this case is there is so much conflicting information so many conflicting stories so I'm just gonna start putting questions that I have out there as I'm reading through this 
Um, first of all, there was a sign on the front of the school that actually talked about the science fair happening that day. And it states that it went on from 8 to 10. So why she chooses to leave at 8.45, I really have no idea. Um, also, based on the picture, it looks like the science fair is actually happening in a classroom, and I believe it happened in his classroom. Um, but I'm not 100% sure of that. It could be that it happened in some other larger room. From things that I've read, I understand that there was a lot of people there. There was a lot of other adults there that were coming to look at exhibits and do all that. And kids were floating around from class to class. Um, so you have a ton of eyewitnesses here. You have him walking in with his stepmother and his exhibit. Obviously, they set it up. Obviously, she takes a picture of him in front of it. And then somehow, see, the logic just doesn't work for me. I don't know if they were in the same room, how is she leaving and he's outside of the room again and then he's walking back into the room. I don't know. I, I just don't know. Did they go into another room to check out different experiments and then um, she decided she had enough and she was going to leave him there for the rest of that time? I really don't know. From what I understand, his class didn't actually start that day until 10, until the end of the science fair. So he had an hour and 15 minutes potentially there where uh, he would have not had class immediately happening. So just it's really tough to, to get a, a good understanding of, of what's happening uh, at the school during this time. Because of this case, there have been some changes implemented at the school. Unfortunately, they didn't have any cameras. They have since added cameras. I believe that there was a private donation made to the school so that they could add cameras. Um, and there was a little bit of a problem in that he was marked absent, but nobody called his stepmom to report that. And there's, once again, conflicting information on this. Um, I'm seeing in some places where the teacher was told that he had a doctor's appointment that day. And um, the stepmother, Terry, says, no, I had set up a doctor's appointment for him, but it was on a different day. I'm not sure why the teacher thought that. Uh, I saw information from the teacher's aide that noted that he was gone and told the teacher about it. And the teacher said that uh, it, was, it was no problem. So that would seem to support uh, her thinking that he was at a doctor's appointment that day. However, his backpack and his jacket were left in the class. So kind of odd to me that um, that didn't trigger at least a phone call home. Uh, and I don't know that talking to the teacher and saying, hey, we have a doctor's appointment today, is that a legit reason to um, not have a proper sign off of something? I mean, when I went to school, you used to have to take a letter to school that was written by your parents to excuse you for a day like that. And the phone call would still happen most of the time anyway. So the mechanics around uh, calling home have since tightened up specifically at this school because of this case. Terry reported Chiron missing at 3.45 after he failed to arrive home at 3.30 as scheduled. No one reported having seen Chiron at the school after the 8.45 bell. His teacher marked him absent after classes began at 10 a.m. She thought he was at a doctor's appointment. Because so many hours had passed since he was last seen, police launched an extensive search immediately. Over the next few days, they interviewed all the students and staff at Skyline Elementary School and searched the school, school grounds, and the surrounding area. It was one of the largest searches in Oregon history. Chiron's loved ones described him as timid and stated he would be unlikely to leave the school and go off on his own. And if you consider you had so many witnesses in there, you had other parents, um, children all over the place, and keep in mind, this is not a hallway that is open. This is a closed off hallway all within a building. Um, so her story is that potentially there was a stranger. She even cites seeming to recall that there was a stranger there that she didn't recognize. Uh, for some reason that didn't trigger her to be extra safe or to stick around with him until his class really began at 10. Uh, so I really don't know if I buy that. I have to tell you that media and the public at large uh, really are targeting his stepmother as being involved here and there are some pretty decent reasons uh, why they should. 
She has been somewhat inconsistent in her statements, even statements that I've seen uh, her give in one place and then another seem to conflict each other. She failed two polygraph tests. She uh, went to take a third one and then refused to take it when she got there. Her excuse for failing the polygraph tests is that she's deaf in one ear and that she has to lip read. It just, it doesn't make sense. Um, there are control questions for handling uh, things like that. But as you guys know, I'm not the biggest proponent of polygraph testing. Um, so I don't think that that's enough necessarily on its own. But let's take a look real quick into what her claims are of what she did after she left Chiron. Uh, we're gonna jump over to Wikipedia. All right, so Terry Horman. Horman's statements to the police indicate that after leaving the school at 8.45 a.m., she ran errands at a local grocery store until about 10.10. Actually, according to information I found, she tried to go to one grocery store to find medication for her daughter. She has a very young daughter, um, and she couldn't find it at the first store, so she went to another store to try to find the medication for her daughter. Um, between 10.10 10 and 11.39 a.m., she states that she drove her daughter around town in an attempt to use the motion of the vehicle to soothe the toddler's earache. Now that conflicts with some video that I've seen of her directly talking about this incident um, where she states she actually pulled over and stopped somewhere for approximately 30 minutes to attempt to soothe her daughter's problem uh, and then continued driving after that. So already just in this I'm seeing her story kind of change up again. Horman went to a local gym at 11.39 and worked out until about 12.40. By 1.21 p.m., she had arrived home and posted photos on Facebook of Chiron at the Science Fair earlier that morning. Um, I've also seen reports that Chiron's father might have actually been home that day or working from home that day. Uh, that might explain how she had the truck. Apparently, he normally would take uh, the truck. Um, so I don't know. Like I, I'm just giving you guys this information as I bumped into it. It's very hard to support or confirm this information because you're finding one story told this way over here. It's told a different way over here. And I'm just at a loss to understand where the truth is in all of this. And unfortunately, so much of the story now focuses on Terry and um, kind of the relationship and aftermath of all this that I think it's pulling focus away from some of the core facts that we should really be focusing on. In particular, that school environment, what was going on that day, and were there any witnesses? I have not bumped into any information of any witnesses saying Chiron left with someone else. I've, I've never run into any of that in searching through, through all this. Now just to give a little backstory, um, Chiron's parents, Kane Andrew Horman and Desiree Young have been divorced since 2003. Terry and Kane married in 2007, but they had been together for several years before that. According to information I've seen, he was actually cheating on his wife Desiree with Terry um, while Desiree was pregnant with Chiron. And I've seen uh, interviews with Terry where she says that she was basically with Chiron since he was three days old. Um, the mother moved out of state, so Terry was really, uh, responsible for him from day to day in terms of mothering him. Uh, he did go visit his mother and her new husband, his new stepfather, who coincidentally uh, is, I believe he's an investigator or a police officer. Um, he did visit them regularly, but in terms of the most, most of his time that he was being raised, it was by uh, Terry and his father. Kane and Terry had a one-year-old daughter, Kiara Ariel Horman, at the time of Chiron's disappearance, and Terry has a teenage son from a previous marriage who was living with her parents in June 2010. In terms of possible motive in this case, um, there is some interesting information about her teenage son. Uh, living with his grandparents in June of 2010, that had only happened fairly recently. He moved out in February of 2010, apparently because uh, things were getting really tough between him and his stepfather, Kane. Um, and there is some question if Terry was upset about the fact that her son had to move away from her. Um, and maybe, potentially, that might have motivated her to, um, to do something with Chiron. I, I really don't know for certain.
Less than two weeks after Chiron's disappearance, police stopped the search and announced they had upgraded this case from a simple missing child to a criminal investigation. At the same time, they stated they didn't think Chiron had been abducted by a stranger. They focused on Terry, stating cellular phone records indicated she wasn't where she said she was on the day of her stepson's disappearance. Let's run a map real quick here. So starting at 15700 Northwest Sheltered Nook Road, this is the home or around the home of where they lived. And down here is Skyline Elementary School. The two stores that I mentioned that she had gone to were both called Fred Meyer. Um, one down here, and that is in Beaverton, Oregon, and the other further down here. Now what's interesting about her cell phone pings is this line out here up to, I believe it's Savi Island. Uh, apparently there's a cell phone tower out here that was uh, tracing her phone. So for some reason, she was out here. Now I've seen her comment about that information in specific, and she says, well, it runs parallel to the 30. I was never at the island, but I was on the 30. And you can see the 30 runs right here. Um, and we know cell phone towers kind of depends on the terrain in the area, but uh, you can figure five to 10 mile radius uh, is where they will usually work. So you get a pretty decent circle here, but none of this seems to be in the right direction for where she supposedly was going for trying to find this medication for her daughter. Um, now, I guess if you believe that she was driving around trying to soothe her daughter, uh, you know, maybe it would make sense that she took a little drive north or something after they left the uh, elementary school. I'm not certain. That's another thing. God, there's so many questions around this. Um, I have seen nothing about where her daughter was while she was at the school with Chiron. Was her daughter with her? Was she carrying her around? I have no idea. Um, it's really frustrating. People Magazine has kind of done this scoop where they finally got Terry to talk again. Uh, essentially, about three or four weeks after this investigation began, uh, she lawyered up and she stopped communicating with police. And then recently, kind of over the past year, she's done a couple of interviews. And People Magazine, I have to say, I watched the interview, I've read the articles on it. They gave the biggest softball interview I've ever seen to someone. Now, admittedly, maybe that's the only way they could get her to agree to it, but their line of questioning was extremely weak, did not dive into any of the details, even for information that she was bringing up that was new. She kept talking about how, oh, if you guys only knew all the, all the information that was out there, and I'm trying to get it out there, I'm trying to get it out there. Well, you're being interviewed. Give it out. <laughs> what, what's the problem here? Uh, outside of that, make a website. There were literally, apparently at one time, dozens and dozens of websites kind of aimed and targeting her. And I can certainly see in comment sections that I've read through and Reddit threads and, and stuff, some people are very hateful towards her. Uh, I even bumped into one YouTube account that was kind of geared about hating uh, Terry. But um, what does it take nowadays for you to kick on a Google site, I mean, you don't even need to know how to code a page anymore. Uh, it's not hard for you to get your information out there. And she, one of the stories that kind of doesn't make sense when I hear her tell it is how she's got all this information she's trying to get out and she just can't get it out and, and no one is there to pick it up. We're out here listening. Uh, people are buying the People magazine. You're literally talking to a reporter while you're saying that and you're not sharing the details that will help us understand. It literally doesn't make sense. Despite all that, I can't say that she did it. I definitely don't have enough information. What I can say is um, I don't trust her very much. And that sucks because that's just a gut feeling thing. And yeah, I could probably you know, crack out an Excel sheet and say, well, she made this statement here and she made this statement there and this doesn't line up. And she made this statement here and this statement here and that doesn't line up. But none of that is going to boil down to the actual mechanics and fact of what, if she did something with him, what did she do with him? Uh, information like this, you got a ping trace that is pretty far north of the area where she says she's driving around. I find that pretty compelling and, and pretty interesting. 
Um, also, I brought this up on a satellite view in particular, so you can see there's not a lot of buildings. Uh, even if she does say she was on the 30, there certainly seems to be a lot of open foliage out here. Um, definitely could be a place where you might be able to hide someone. So, very, very frustrating. And if that wasn't weird enough, three weeks after Chiron's disappearance on June 26th, Kane moved out of the family home. That same day, Terry placed two 911 calls from their residence. The first one at 517 was classified as a threats call, and the second at 1139 was classified as a child custody call. Kane wasn't home when either call was placed. During the following days, the police released more information to the public. A landscaper who worked for the Horman family had told investigators that about six or seven months before Chiron disappeared, Terry offered him money to kill her husband. When authorities notified Kane of this, the news prompted him to take Kiara and move out. The police attempted a sting, bringing the landscaper to Terry's door to demand money while undercover agents watched from nearby, but Terry called 911 instead to say someone was demanding $10,000 from her. So she now denies this. Um, she says that she had never offered money to this guy to kill her husband, that this guy was actually hitting on her and she didn't accept his advances, so she thinks this is some kind of revenge plot against her. Uh, also worth noting around this time frame, uh, she was spoken to by some media source, um, particularly about there being a problem in the relationship, and she says, no, no, there's no problem in the relationship, and then literally the next day everyone finds out, oh, the husband has left the home and taken the daughter. Um, since then, the husband has gained full custody of the daughter. Um, apparently, she did have a previous DUI charge where she was driving around with her teenage son, so that was seen as uh, endangering a child's life. So I believe, don't know for certain, because I haven't reviewed all the court documents, but I believe that that threat uh, helped Chiron's father get full custody of the young daughter. Um, and outside of that, some other things that have happened. Terry has tried to change her name twice. The courts have not allowed her to. Uh, I did listen to a piece of tape from uh, her trying to do it once and how the judge responded to her. And he kind of drilled to the point of, well, why are you doing this? Why are you trying to change your name? And eventually uh, she came back to, I've got so many people targeting me. This is about the Chiron Horman disappearance. And it was like once the judge heard that, he was like, yeah, no, you're, you're not going to have your name changed. Um, she did get a job for a short period of time, but apparently um, she got a little too much media focus around that. So she left the position of her own accord. She wasn't forced out. They didn't fire her once they found out about Chiron or anything like that. But uh, apparently since that has not been working, living uh, back at her mother's house, and what I find strange, I watched a, a clip with her speaking where she says that her focus is to find Chiron, but apparently she's not even in that state anymore. I don't see of any uh, indication of her helping this search whatsoever. Once again, where's your website? Where is a GoFundMe account that you open? Where are you trying to hire private investigators? Where are you trying to get a job so you can get the resources to try to find Chiron? Uh, she claims that finding him getting her daughter back and then getting a job are her priority in that order. I just, I'm not seeing it. It's just one, another one of those statements that just doesn't ring true. Kane filed for divorce and a restraining order from Terry. Uh, he accused Terry of attempting to abduct Kiara from her daycare two days after the restraining order was granted, of beginning an affair with another man four days after Kane moved out, and of sharing sensitive information including Kane's new address with the man. And apparently she will now fess up to that. She was caught because there was digital information. She was sexting with a guy four days after her husband moved out. Keep in mind, this is about a month after Chiron goes missing. And the guy that she was sexting with, former uh, high school buddy of Kane's. Kane stated Terry suffered from postpartum depression after Kiara's birth and her behavior changed. In court documents, he claimed she is an alcoholic has a personality disorder, and is severely emotionally disturbed. Kane said he believed Kiara was not safe with her mother and may have witnessed whatever happened to Chiron on the day he disappeared. Some of Terry's acquaintances reported that she was angry with Kane for making her teenage son move out of their home, which he did in February of 2010, four months before Chiron's disappearance. 
Desiree told reporters that she had attempted to get custody of Chiron prior to his disappearance and that Chiron had told her several times that he wanted to come live with her. What I wonder is what was the relationship really like between Chiron and Terry? Was it rough? Was she abusive with him when the father wasn't around? Um, was he acting up that day in school and did she get frustrated and take him outside? I don't think so. There's something about this that feels kind of calculated to me. Um, you have her taking him there, taking a picture with him, um, and then disappearing for a period of time for a couple of hours that are kind of hard to really trace, uh, and then popping up back at home. Uh, on that specific day, her husband is at least home early enough, even if he wasn't working at home that day, he's at least home early enough to walk with her to the bus stop that that Chiron is usually dropped off at and together they learn Chiron is not on the bus and then from there they deduce that he is missing. Um, it sure seems to me that if she is involved with this um, there is a stall tactic being put in place here. Uh, I almost feel like potentially Chiron could have been handed off to someone else and she was creating this kind of window buffer of six hours or so where that person could, I mean, they're in Oregon, that person could have headed for Canada, who knows. Um, outside of that, if it was something about disposing Chiron, there's something about the time period that seems, seems like she was engineering it to me, if she is truly the culprit in this. Um, and like perhaps if there was a moving body of water and she thought that if the police didn't start looking for a couple hours that, you know, he would disappear further away or some, something along those lines. But if this is engineered, uh, it seems to me that she was trying to buy time for something to occur before they made the discovery about him missing. And some people do say that it's unfortunate that it was treated as a missing child case right off the bat because the resources for that are considerably different than if they thought something had happened to him uh, criminal. Um, but even outside of all that, this is one of the biggest uh, search and response cases to happen in Oregon. I saw some figures on it. I mean, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars were spent on this. Um, people all the way from Clear Channel donating their time, Class Kids was participating in this. Um, there was a lot of people that wanted to help bring Chiron home. And unfortunately, up till today, we just haven't found that answer yet, where Chiron is. So I think I've gone into enough of it. There are a lot more twists and turns. There was a friend of hers that was looked into, uh, Dee Dee Speicher of Tualatin. Investigators searched Speicher's condominium last week and have interviewed people who saw Speicher on June 4th, the day Chiron disappeared. Uh, as a matter of fact, this link at OregonLive.com, you can find in the description box below, is an amazing timeline of the events and it literally goes on for years, tracking everything that has happened around this case, everything that has happened around the fallout of the family, the divorce proceedings. Um, this is where I found the audio clip of the judge responding to her request to change her name. Um, I highly, highly recommend that you check out this link on this timeline and just go through these events. And then uh, that could be a good place to kind of split you off into the many, many different areas of investigation into this case that people can do. And honestly, I need your guys' help on this. This is a big one. There is tons of media out there. I was only able to scratch the surface for this episode. Um, and there's, it's weird because I'm conflicted. There's so much of it that has to do with Terry but I don't want to only focus on Terry. I think there are other possibilities for where Chiron could be. Um, and I, I would like to see some of those kind of fleshed out. So either way, if you bump into new information, other details that you think are important, please drop them in the comments box below. And let's see if we can do something to hopefully help Chiron Horman come home. Uh, if you have friends, particularly in the Portland, Oregon area, I'd say even Washington, and there's something about being so close to Canada that just kind of gets me. As a matter of fact, I heard something about his mother um, possibly moving to Canada for treating some medical condition that she had. Um, there's something about that, that if he is alive, he might have been taken out of the country. Um, outside of that, 
they are still doing events. They are still doing searches. From what I could see just about a month ago, they had an annual car show that they do to raise awareness to him. Apparently his father is very active in doing events uh, to keep awareness raised around this. And of course there is a GoFundMe. This is started by his biological mother's sister. Uh, at one point she was going to sue Terry uh, she decided to not sue Terry because it was supposedly going to impede the investigation. So this GoFundMe has now been reappropriated to help them uh, in their search efforts. And you can see they've raised over $33,000 of 50. And I got to tell you guys, for a search that's been going on for five years, $33,000 uh, $33, um, would seem like a lot of money to a lot of people. but. I'm pretty sure with private investigator costs, um, flyers, signs, I mean, doing all that kind of stuff, I'm pretty sure that money has gone quickly. So if you would consider donating to it, I will have a link in the description box below so you could possibly help support the search for Chiron in that way as well. And of course, if you're in the Oregon area, keep an eye out for organized searches. I know that they're still doing them fairly often um, and maybe you can actually participate and get out there and maybe help find this kid. Heartbreaker um, of, of two episodes today, but uh, this is why I do it. I'm hoping that someday one of these videos is going to get in the right hands. Maybe you have information that can break this case loose, help the authorities. If you do, please use the contact information below and contact them. Submit that tip forward and maybe you can make a big change in many people's lives. Many people that really have some big broken hearts and maybe even one woman that potentially could be um, unjustly scrutinized around all this. It's possible. Thank you so much for joining me on this Brain Scratch Searchlight. I'll catch you on the next show on the Lord and Arts channel and I hope you have a great day. Take care.